Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Will Martin. I'm one of the uh, clinical instructors in rheumatology at UCLA, and I work in the UCLA Westlake Village uh, Clinic that's recently opened up. Um, I left some business cards over on the table over there if anyone's interested uh, at the end of the talk. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about gout. Uh, it's a very common inflammatory arthritis, uh, especially as people get older, and so I think it'll have some um, relevance for a lot of people, whether you have gout or know somebody who does, uh, it's a very common condition. So I think uh, uh, hopefully this will be informative for you and, uh, and enjoyable. Um, so, I can get this, uh, so I'm just going to give you a brief outline here what I'll be talking about. I'll talk a little bit about the history of gout, uh, some of the background and basics. Um, gout is really a, a condition that is involved um, with the byproducts of purine metabolism, which are uh, things that are found in food as well as produced by the body uh, itself. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the stages of gout, um, treatment, some of the conditions that are associated with it, and then I'll briefly summarize for you what we've, what we've talked about. Um, so this is a very uh, famous photo, or not photo, but a caricature uh, by a uh, caricature artist uh, in London by the name of James Gilray from 1799, which I think is uh, very representative of how gout feels uh, to people, which is almost like a little monster is biting your big toe, uh, causing a lot of inflammation and pain. Um, so some of the history, this condition was first identified uh, by the Egyptians in about 2600 BC. Uh, later Hippocrates in the 5th century BC identified this and called it the unwalkable disease because of the significant pain associated with it. Um, it's actually derived from the Latin word gutta, which means drop in Latin. And it's based on a medieval belief that um, of the four humors that were, were felt to be in equilibrium when someone is healthy, if one of those humors was to drop into the foot, it would cause gout uh, and significant pain and inflammation. And these, these are actually the the four humors, I'd actually, this, I discovered this in preparing for this talk, I hadn't really realized what these were, but um, in, in the old days, uh, the health was determined by the balance of these things, including yellow bile, blood, phlegm, and black bile, uh, which is sort of an interesting historical uh, point. Basically, this gout has always been considered um, uh, a disease of kings because it's, it's been associated with excess, excessive food intake, alcohol intake, uh, rich foods, uh, affluent lifestyle. Um, the first treatment for this discovered it was colchicine, okay, and this is something we actually still use today, but it was used in ancient Greece initially as a, uh, as a purgative, basically to treat constipation because it does, one of the side effects of colchicine, unfortunately, is diarrhea. Um, and they derived this uh, medication from the autumn crocus at that time. Um, it was first used as a gout treatment in the 6th century AD by a Chris Byzantine Christian physician by the name of Alexander of Tralles. Um, throughout time, you know, it's only more recently that we've discovered the, the medications that we typically use to, to prevent gout flares, that is to, to lower the uric acid level, which we call uricosuric agents. Uh, and xanthin oxidase inhibitors are much more recent advances. Where, excuse me, where does that action take place in the liver? Which one? Xanthin oxidase. Xanthin oxidase? Uh, it takes place basically in, in all cells of the body. Um, any cells that are actively metabolizing have this, the, the process that requires xanthin oxidase. So some background and basics. So what is gout? Gout is basically a condition uh, such that um, what are called monosodium urate crystals come out of solution, so they're dissolved in your blood, and basically they can crystallize and form uh, in your joints, causing pain and inflammation. Okay, when these crystals come out of solution and form a solid, basically, in your joint spaces, um, white blood cells come in and start to eat those crystals and release all kinds of inflammatory uh, molecules that cause pain and inflammation, okay? And it's not just joints as well. I mean, people think mostly gout is involving with the joints, okay? But there's also soft tissues around the joints, okay? There's uh, uh, pockets of fluid called bursa 
which are on uh, edges of certain bones, and those can become uh, um, involved with gout as well, okay? As well as around tendon sheaths uh, as well. And so why do they occur? Why do gout flares occur? Basically, um, if there's any chemists in the room, there's uh, in most um, uh, uh, crystals, there's a point where it dissolves in solution. For example, if you dissolve uh, salt in water, it, the, the crystal form that you have that's a solid will dissolve into the water if you um, drop it in some water. It's, it's similar for gout crystals, okay? Monosodium urate or uric acid, it typically is in the dissolved form in your blood and doesn't form crystals. However, if, the, if there's enough of the urate around such that it exceeds the point at which it can uh, saturate the solution and therefore form a crystal, it will form a crystal, okay? And that, that level of uh, concentration where that typically happens is about 6.8 milligrams per deciliter, um, which is a, an important number because when we're treating uh, you for gout over the long term, our goal is to get the concentration of the, of the uric acid less than six, okay, to help prevent the, the crystals from forming. Um, and this isn't a perfect number. People, uh, plenty of people can be walking around with a uric acid level of eight or nine, and they're not having problems with gout flares. And it, sometimes, you know, this isn't an absolute marker. Sometimes the uric acid crystals can become super saturated and still not dissolve out of solution. But the main point is, if you get, as long as you get the uric acid concentration less than six, you can pretty much prevent gout flares, okay? So who gets gout? Uh, it's present in up to 15% of the population, okay? It tends to be in males more than females. Um, especially premenopausal females very rarely get gout, okay? There's, uh, it's believed that this is due to some of the uh, estrogens and things that helps to keep the uric acid from, from becoming as great of a concentration in the blood and it's more easily excreted in the, through the kidneys. Uh, but postmenopausal women, we find that they can get gout just as frequently as men because they have less of the, of the, of the, of the hormones to help, to help prevent the uric acid from building up. Um, definitely it's more of a condition of the old uh, more than the young. Uh, children are very able to clear uric acid from their kidneys and therefore don't have problems with gout. So that we find that as the uric acid concentration in the blood rises, uh, the, the incidence of gout, meaning the occurrence of gout, increases. Okay, so 5% uh, of people, uh, essentially with a uric acid level greater than 9 milligrams per deciliter, will have an attack of gout in a given year. Okay, and if you watch those, uh, that same group of people with this level of uric acid over five years, 22% of them will have a gout flare. If the, if the level of uric acid is between seven and nine, uh, one half percent of those individuals will have uh, a gout flare, okay? And if the uric acid level is point, uh, sorry, if the uric acid level is less than seven, point one percent of those people have a gout flare. So definitely, the higher your uric acid level, the more likely you are to have gout, okay? And so where does uric acid come from? As I alluded to previously, uh, it's basically the, an end product of purine metabolism, okay? And purines are uh, the building blocks of DNA and RNA, so the building blocks of pretty much all the cells in your body, okay? And as cells break down, those ingredients of the cells sort of get broken down as well and become um, uh, present ultimately in the blood as uric acid, okay? Um, and purines are both produced by the body during the cell breakdown process, but they're also ingested, okay? A lot of people with gout, uh, there are certain foods that they eat that can make them more likely to have gout flares and more likely to increase the uric acid in their blood, okay? <coughs> Including meats, alcohol, uh, things of this nature, high fructose corn syrup, so things found in sugar sodas. Um, these are all uh, high purine containing foods that can increase your uric acid level and make you more likely to have a gout flare. So an interesting uh, point as well, okay, a lot of uh, animals in the animal kingdom have a, an enzyme called uricase, which is able to break down uric acid, 
Okay, so gout is a condition of humans and primates who don't have this, uh, this enzyme. Okay, uh, therefore the uric acid that we're not able to excrete in our kidneys can build up in the body and lead to ultimately gout. Okay, whereas other animals have this uricase enzyme that essentially breaks down uh, uric acid and prevents, um, prevents gout flares. Now, uric acid is felt to have possibly some evolutionary advantage in that it can scavenge uh, oxygen-free radicals, which are uh, molecules in the body which can cause damage to the body, can lead to cancer, can lead to aging. Um, uh, uric acid can scavenge some of those things and um, have some benefit there, but the um, bottom line is it also can lead to gout. Okay. So basically this is just sort of summarizing what I've mentioned. Um, you know, our body, in our bodies we make uh, new purines as we're building cells. Uh, we also take in purines from the diet. Uh, we lose some of these uh, purines on a daily basis, or sorry, the purines are ultimately broken down into uric acid. We lose uh, a lot of the uric acid through the urine and the kidneys. We lose some through the intestine, and then we have some that just remains in the uric acid pool and is, is available for other uh, bodily functions, you know, breaking down, serving as antioxidants, etc. So some of the um, foods to be avoided, okay, if you have gout or you know someone who has gout and you're wondering what foods should I avoid uh, to have a lower purine intake, um, you know, definitely avoiding animal-based proteins, okay, especially red meats, uh, but also seafood, poultry, uh, liver, kidney, heart, gizzard, sweetbreads, meat extracts, yeast extract, these are all uh, high purine content foods and can in increase your risk for gout. Okay, certain al alcohol, okay, especially liquor and, and beer and beer products. Wine hasn't been associated as much with, with uh, gout and causing higher uric acid level. Uh, certain veg vegetables, okay, peas, beans, spinach, uh, lentils, there's no confirmed association, but there's some people who feel that lentils can, is, is, can lead to higher uric acid levels and, 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 and gout as well. Okay, and so one thing that I want to comment here is on a strict low purine diet, uh, protein should be derived principally from eggs and cheese, okay? And if you have gout or you have uh, high uric acid and you're wondering what, what you can eat to get good protein, eggs and cheese is a good way to go. Uh, you can also... Um, have grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts are considered uh, good. Okay? A question. Uh-huh. Uh, the uh, people who give advice on diets frequently want to be entirely qualitative. They don't give great relative uh, impacts of the different uh, lists of stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, how could we get a more precise statement of the diet for a person's gout. In terms of? Well, in terms of how much uh, uh, broccoli versus asparagus, all of that. Yeah, I don't know that anybody's broken that down. I think, I think a lot of these recommendations and a lot of these observations are based on a sort of a general approach. Yeah, that's approach. the problem. And, and milk versus, uh, let's say, soy milk and uh, uh, other milks. Well, milk, milk and dairy products are actually protective. So you can actually but is drinking that true of soy milk. Soy milk. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The soy milk. It may be. You know. It, it may be different because it's not a strict dairy product. It's more of a. Uh, what is the direction one should take to try to find out precision in the diet recommendations? Um, well, you know, I think. You know, I'm sure that I'm sure that if you do a search for gout related diet. Um, there's probably, probably somebody has strong opinions about specifics in terms of whether or not a certain meat versus another meat is going to be more likely to cause gout. My guess is there hasn't been any large scale randomized controlled trial comparing beef versus fish. I mean, I, I think there, there's just, there's food products that, that do tend to increase your uric acid level and, and are felt to be high in purines and to lead to gout flares. And, and these are the ones that come up on our list. You know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about the specifics. I don't know if anybody is. So. 
Is there yes. a difference between on the meats and the poultry like chicken? Um, I wasn't really sure about chicken. I thought chicken was kind of okay. It, you know, but is and then my next question would be: is We're talking about organic versus inorganic. You know, like some of the natural ones, like Sprouts has like natural supposedly as an idea of chicken. I mean, that's kind of like is that high purines? I wasn't aware of chicken per se. Well, chicken, you know, I I think you're right. I mean, I think definitely beef is considered probably higher purine. Seafood, probably second to that, and then probably poultry would be third to that. I mean, I, I agree, I hear what you're saying. You know, poultry isn't as high in purines probably as beef, but it's still found to have an increased incidence and risk of having gout flares because of the purine content. But then the next question is, is similar to his, is how much can we not, are we not supposed to have any of that, some of that, or part of it? No, to be honest, <laughs> in somebody who has gout, yeah. what I tell my patients is, First of all, the amount that you can actually improve your uric acid level by cutting out some of these things is pretty minimal. Okay, you could take, let's say your uric acid level is eight. Okay, if you, if you optimized your diet, if you ate nothing that had high purines, if you followed a very strict low purine diet, the most you could improve or decrease your uric acid level would be one milligram per deciliter. Okay, so you could drop it from eight to seven. But that's still not gonna prevent you from having gout flares. What you really need is medication to do that. So it's not, so it's, it's, it's always helpful to be on a good diet, but once we start treating you for gout, pretty much you can eat what you want, you know? Just how about more. very high water intake? Very high water intake? Yes. That's fine. Well, it's, is it really effective? Is it effective? Oh, at, at preventing gout flares? Uh, of reducing uh, uric acid levels in the blood. Well, I mean, it, it, transiently, I suppose if you drink a lot of water before you, you urinate the extra water out, transiently I guess it could drop your uric acid concentration a little bit because you're increasing the total fluid in your body. Um, but again, that would be transient. If you're just drinking free water, you know, you'd end up filtering that out through your kidneys in a hurry. Um, so, yes? Uh, I missed the beginning. Uh -huh. Are split peas, uh, if you have like split pea soup, is that considered Purine? Yeah, peas, peas are considered to be fairly high in purines. So of the vegetables, peas we tend to, to recommend avoiding if you want to be on a, on a, a low purine diet. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah, some of the medications. Okay. So this, this is the, uh, these are the latest guidelines for uh, recommendations for dietary management of gout. Okay, this has recently come out in the, um, these are recommendations from the American College of Rheumatology. And uh, basically what we have here, you see the letters A, B, and C. So if it's a level A advice, that means there's been multiple randomized control trials testing these things, and it's a very firm recommendation that that's a, a, a true thing that'll cause higher your gas <coughs> level. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a level B means that there's been a single <coughs> randomized control trial. <coughs> and level C means that basically the experts say that that's probably true. Okay. So basically, rec the recommendations, the latest recommendations from the American College of Rheumatology are to avoid the meats, like I mentioned, okay, sweetbreads, liver, kidney, to avoid high fructose corn syrups like found in sodas, okay? Diet sodas are fine, okay? It's just the highly sweetened sodas that are problematic. Um, avoiding alcohol overuse. Uh, and, um, you know, recommendations to limit these things, beef, lamb, and pork, seafoods with high purine content such as sardines and shellfish. Uh, and then servings of naturally sweet fruit juices, okay? Sugars, sweetened beverages and desserts, table salts, uh, and alcohol, especially beer, as I mentioned, okay? And then to encourage low-fat or non-fat dairy products, uh, which, again, can help protect you from gout, okay? And then eating vegetables is also recommended. Now, as I mentioned, though, even if you optimize your diet, you're, you're not going to, you know, if you're walking around with an elevated uric acid level, Optimizing your diet is not going to get you to the point necessarily where you're not going to have gout flares. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and again, most patients who are having recurrent gout attacks need to be on medication. So this is just a brief list of causes of high uric acid level, okay, due to increased production of, of uh, purines, okay, and the way that I tend to look at this or envision this is conditions in your body that cause a lot of cell breakdown can lead to a high uric acid level, okay, because uric acid and purines are part of the, the uh, or what makes up a cell, especially the DNA of the cell. So okay. basically, um, okay. Um, so basically, if you have a lymphoma or other kind of um, blood cell disorder, if you're producing a lot of uh, extra cells from a malignancy, for example, a cancer, that causes cells to break down ultimately, and that leads to uh, increased uric acid. So things like uh, lymphoproliferative disorders like lymphoma, for example, uh, hemolytic disorders, disorders where your blood cells are breaking down for some reason. Um, uh, you know, we mentioned alcohol, uh, fructose. Um, so these are all conditions where you're going to end up having more uric acid due to cells breaking down or to dehydration from alcohol. Yes. When you say hemolytic, could that be like ITP? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about sarcoidosis? Sarcoidosis again is a is a condition where you have um, basically what's called granulomas uh, in your body, which are areas of um, uh, inflammation, okay, and cell breakdown, okay. So basically, you're in, in those granulomas, cells are being turned over, leading to breakdown in purine synthesis, okay. So that also can lead to elevated uric acid levels. And these are uh, conditions that can lead to elevated uric acid because it's not getting cleared from the, from the, from the urine, okay? Basically, any, any kidney dysfunction uh, that affects how well your kidneys clear uh, uric acid can lead to an elevated level in the blood, okay? Um, so a little bit now about the stages of gout, okay? Basically, when somebody develops gout, it goes through three basic phases. Okay? Initially, people have uh, what's called asymptomatic hyperuricemia, which means they've got an elevated uric acid level in the blood, but it doesn't affect them in any way. They don't, they don't realize they have an elevated uric acid level, and they don't have any problems as a result of that. Okay? And this, this can go on for years. Okay? Some people can walk around their whole lives with an elevated uric acid level and never have a gout attack, which is great. Okay? Other people who ultimately develop gout have probably been walking around with a high uric acid level for a number of years, and then finally one day they, they get to a point where they have their first gout attack, okay? Um, and that's when that period of asymptomatic hyperuricemia ends. After that, we have what's called intercritical gout, which means people will have periodic flares of gout, okay? They might have a flare, and then two years later they'll have another flare, and then six months later they'll have another flare. So let's start to have periodic flares of gout. Okay. Even though they're on medication? Or? Uh, this is more untreated. This is oh, more people who are untreated. Got it. Okay. Now this brings up a good point though. Some people, we don't make a decision to treat uh, patients for uh, gout in terms of lowering their uric acid level until they're having at least two flares per year. Okay. Okay, so if a person's having one flare of gout and then a year later they have another flare of gout, we usually prefer to just treat the, the flares as they come. Okay, if they reach a point where they're having a flare uh, two times a year, at least, then we, we decide, well, it's probably better to just help prevent these gout flares by getting the uric acid level down to a, a level where they're not going to be having the, the flares of gout. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. Would you, uh, can you give me a, a range of what you consider a flare at this stage? The, the range of? Uh, just what a flare would be at that stage. Uh, the intercritical? These are all, the first one is critical. Oh, sorry, intercritical is more the, 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 def, the, 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 the name for this period of time when somebody is between not having gout flares and then having chronic gout. So basically intercritical, it just means that you're having periodic flares of gout. Okay, periodic flares of joint pain, redness, uh, severe inflammation. Okay, I'm, I'm imagine, uh, so what I'm looking for is an explanation of the 
how it should feel. I was just diagnosed, I have not had a flare-up. Uh -huh. So how will I know that it, when I do have a flare-up, I mean, in this stage, is this just... Oh, so you haven't had a gout flare no. specifically. They you just noticed I... You just, they told flare. you you have a high uric acid level. Right. Okay. So that, so that would put you in this group. Okay. Asymptomatic hyperuricemia, you have a high uric acid level, it doesn't have any consequence for you. Okay. So what you're wondering is, when you have a gout flare, what would it be like? Yes. Okay. Thank okay. You. Sorry. Um, what is it? So um, basically, the, the classic presentation, and I'll mention this soon as well, but the, the classic presentation for gout is called podagra. Okay. It's a big toe. The, basically the ball of your foot, where, that, where, your, where your, uh, your big toe is. It'll get red, painful, hot. So painful, it'll be very difficult for you to walk on it, typically. Um, the flare, you know, if, if you don't treat it, uh, will tend to get extremely painful over the first 24 to 48 hours and then gradually improve. Okay, all gout flares ultimately resolve on their own, even if untreated. Okay, but it's very uncomfortable to wait and not be treated. Um, so podagra, or, the, or gout flare in the big toe, is the classic presentation initially of gout. Okay? Other people don't follow the textbooks, and they might show up with a swollen, painful knee or an ankle. Some people can rarely have a first gout flare in a wrist or an elbow. You know, it's not a perfect uh, science, but most people have initial gout flare in the lower extremities, typically the big toe. What would be the second most popular then, the knee or the ankle? Probably the knee. The knee. Yeah, yeah. T typically the lower extremity, yeah. Um, and then, so after somebody... Is, is un, if someone is untreated and they're having repeated gout flares, ultimately they'll get to a point where they're sort of having gout continuously and they're having like, they, they develop chronic deposits of, of gout crystals, which is called tophus. Okay? And a tophus is basically just a, a collection of, of uric acid crystals that form into a solid right around your joints. Okay, and I'll show you some pictures of that uh, here shortly. Um, so the symptoms of acute gout, sort of what we've uh, touched on, you know, severe pain, redness, swelling of a joint, joints, or surrounding tissues, okay? Very debilitating. Uh, people who have gout say it's the most painful thing that they've ever experienced. I'm sure short of childbirth, that's probably true. Um, the maximal severity, again, is typically within the first uh, 12 to 24 hours. Uh, again, completely resolves within a few weeks if, if left untreated, but it's a painful few weeks unless you're, you're getting treated for it. Uh, again, lower extremity involvement 80% of the time. Uh, initial attacks involve a single joint in the lower extremities, you know, typically either a big toe or a knee. Um, but again, gout can show up pretty much in any joint that it desires. So this is sort of classic podagra. Uh, you see very inflamed, swollen, uh, big toe. Okay. Um, this is very typical presentation. This is another picture. This isn't quite as clear, but you can see a little bit, oops, a little bit of uh, inflammation here around the big toe. Uh, and then this is gout in a knee. Okay, you can see a lot of, a lot of swelling here, huge effusion. Okay, I think if you uh, put a needle in this gentleman's knee and drew some of the fluid out, you probably have four or five hundred uh, mLs. Of, of fluid, I would guess. Would they do that? They yeah, they no, I mean, that? If, if, someone, if someone comes with, a, with one large inflamed joint, the, the, the best way to, to relieve them, if it's gout, is to drain the fluid out of there and give them a steroid shot right into that joint, oh. uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's only one joint that's affected. Okay. And we actually need to get, if, we, if, if, this, if, there's, if there's not a clear diagnosis of gout yet, this is also a great way to diagnose gout, because you really need to see the crystals in the joint to make the diagnosis of gout. So, so wait, so how do you see the crystals if they're in the knee, in the joint? Yeah, so, by taking out the Yeah, blood? you have to put a needle in the joint, ah. drain out the fluid, and then you, and then you look at it under a microscope it. with a, what's called a polarized, uh, uh, polarized light. And the, the crystals of gout uh, look a certain way under polarized light microscopy. Okay, thank you. Uh, so some of the triggers for an acute gout flare. Um, 
are, are what you see here, some of which we've touched on, but trauma. Like I've had patients come in and say, oh yeah, I stubbed my toe a week ago and ever since then it's been red and painful. Um, so that, that can just, traumatizing a joint can, can trigger gout if you're sort of on the cusp of, of having your first gout flare. Um, trauma can do that. Uh, recent surgery, um, starvation, and that's probably because if you're starving, your body's having to, to um, digest itself, sort of, uh, to, get, to get energy to you, and that's breaking down cells and causing elevation in, in uric acid. Uh, fatty foods, dietary overindulgence, Dehydration, you know, probably if you're dehydrated, again, the, the concentration of uric acid will rise if you have less free water in your body. Um, interestingly, and this is something that, that comes up again and again in the management of gout, okay? We as rheumatologists, when we treat gout, we treat acute gout flares with anti-inflammatory medications, okay? That's one component of gout treatment. The second component is to get the uric acid level down so you don't have gout flares, okay? And so we put people on medications that lower the uric acid level, but in manipulating the uric acid level by lowering it, we actually put patients at risk for gout flare, okay? Because any time the uric acid level goes up or down, for whatever reason, that makes your, the, the crystals more likely to form, okay? But uh -huh. at the same time, if you're, say, if you're giving or taking Motrin, that's a blood thinner. So isn't that also going to, go ahead. Yeah, so Motrin is primarily an anti-inflammatory. Right. Okay. And so when we, when we start somebody on a medication to get their uric acid level down, like allopurinol, for example, or Euloric, something like that, we always put you on something in the background, okay, either colchicine or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like Motrin, uh, for example, to help prevent a gout flare while we're bringing your uric acid level down. Okay. Because it was just by adding that medication to decrease the uric acid level, we actually put people at risk for having gout attacks. Mm -hmm. Yes? Would you get us on board with this culture chain? 150 years ago, somebody thought that was a good idea for gout? But even longer ago, 7th century AD apparently, or 6th century AD. Why did they think it would help? You know, I'm, I'm guessing somebody one day had some while they were having a gout flare and realized it felt better. That's my, that's my guess. Uh, I think that, as I, as I mentioned, I think initially the, um, uh, in the, uh, in, I think it was like the 6th century BC, in Hippocrates' time, they, they, would, they would basically, um, the autumn crocus or whatever the, the, the plant was, they, they, they found that that was helpful uh, as well because it contains colchicine, but I don't think anybody knew at that time what the colchicine was, but they found that ingesting that particular plant helped with well, gout symptoms. Why colchicine helps? Yeah, so basically, um, colchicine essentially prevents white blood cells from spraying out all these inflammatory uh, molecules that cause pain and inflammation. Okay, because when you have a gout attack, the neutrophils, which are the white blood cells, or, or a certain kind of white blood cell, gobble up the gout crystals in your joint. And when it does that, it causes the white blood cell to become activated and irritated and release these inflammatory. And today, what is the most effective drug for actually driving uric acid level down? Well, there's, well, there's several, okay? The, the one that we typically start with is allopurinol, okay? Euloric is another one that's very similar to allopurinol that we use. Uh, there's, uh, there's a <coughs> medication called probenicid, Okay, which is a, what we call a uricosuric agent, which, help, which helps you uh, eliminate uric acid through the urine okay, by essentially peeing out extra uric acid. Um, the other two, the allopurinol and the uloric, sort of prevent the uric acid from forming, whereas the probenicid helps you excrete the uric acid. And then the, probably the most powerful medication we have for dropping the uric acid level is called peglodicase, which is basically... Basically, uricase. I think I mentioned that humans don't have uricase to break down uric acid. But in extreme gout or in patients who are not able to tolerate the other medications, uh, peglodicase can rapidly drop the uric acid level almost down to nothing because um, it basically just breaks all the uric acid down to something called allantoin, which is then excreted from the body. And starvation. <coughs> says up there on that chart. 
What's that? Starvation. Yeah. How does that hurt? Well, my, my guess is that, you know, if you're starving, your body needs to develop uh, energy from someplace, and it probably essentially starts digesting itself and breaking down its own cells to, to meet its metabolic demands, and that probably drives up the pur purine level and the uric acid level. What, what about black cherry juice? You've read controversy on that one. Um, yeah, I think, I don't think there's a clear answer on that. I mean, I think it is controversial. Uh, I think that there's no clear evidence that it's going to cause a gout flare, but I don't think anybody, I think people still feel that, that it may be a risk no, for gout. To prevent. Oh, to prevent gout? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think that it's, it's certainly not something that is actively recommended to prevent gout flares. I think it helps. I've had it and it works. Okay. Just FYI. Can you talk about cherries? Yeah. Yeah, black cherry, cherry juice. juice. Yeah. Natural, not the one that's sweet. Okay. Took the pills the juice. Okay. No, I took the juice. I had a big flare up and it came, it helped. Okay. Is, is, know, is gout enough. considered an autoimmune disease? Uh, not exactly. Not exactly. Autoimmune disease is more of a, a disease where our body produces antibodies that then attack our own cells. Gout is more a condition of crystal formation in the joint and then our immune system in trying to eradicate the crystals releases inflammation that causes pain. But it's not, not an autoimmune condition. Um, yes? Can you break down a little bit more specifically or on the beer? Like imports versus regular beer, or just all beer? <laughs> Sorry. And then the next one would be spirits. <laughs> we got to enjoy a little bit of life here. <laughs> Is there some that you really just can't ever say no? You just got to say no to? Um, but you know what I mean? Well, I think um, basically in terms of the beers, imports versus you know, non-imports, I mean, I think you're basically looking at the alcohol content. And the higher the alcohol content, which probably would be higher in a lot of imported beers, probably the more likely, the more likely would lead to a gout, uh, gout flare. Okay. Um, liquors, you know, I don't think, again, I, I don't think there's any clear indication, at least that I've come across, that one liquor is less likely to cause gout than another. Um, I think they're grouped as a, as a whole in terms of um, putting you at risk for gout. I think it's the yeast in the beer that makes it double wine. That's probably true. Because when I used to drink a lot of beer, and now I might have one a day, and I don't have a problem. But the thing that's not on this list that I think is one of my problems is stress. Uh huh. Now I've had attacks where it could be the kind of a stress, maybe a personal, a personal life stress situation. Uh huh. And uh, where I've taken care of the food and everything, and I agree, it doesn't uh -huh. affect. The uric cancer level, but it's almost like a trauma to uh -huh. my body. Uh -huh. And I've had personal problems, and then all of a uh -huh. sudden I have this gout attack. Yes. Yeah, and I and I've I've actually heard that from patients as well. And I don't know if it's the stress specifically, or if maybe you're altering your lifestyle a little bit when you're stressed. If you're eating yeah, more, I if you're when I get stressed, yeah, I yeah. No, I mean, but I have heard that from patients as well. But I, my guess is there's probably something in your lifestyle that changes as well. Yes? When, <coughs> when a person has gout, is their sedimentation rate elevated? It, if they're having an active gout flare, it tends to be elevated, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as I touched on, you know, to diagnose gout, to officially clearly diagnose gout, we need to see the uric acid crystals in the joint, okay? So if someone comes into us, they say, oh, I've got this, this knee that's red, hot, swollen, painful, can't bend it. You know, I, it started after I had a 12-pack of beer with my buddies. Uh, you know, a lot of times the, 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 when we look at a, at a swollen, hot, painful joint, you know, we, we worry about a few things. One is a, an infection, okay, an infection in the joint. Another is a crystalline arthritis. Okay, such as gout or pseudogout. Uh, 
you know, we, we, we worry as well about other kinds of inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, things of that nature. Um, but typically the first couple things that go through our mind it, when somebody comes in with one hot, painful, swollen joint is, is this a crystal arthritis such as gout or is this an infection? Okay? And to really determine that, you need to get the fluid out of the joint and, and number one, send it for bacterial culture to see if it's an infection. And number two, to look at the crystals under the, the microscope to look, or sorry, look at the fluid under the microscope to, to see if there's crystals there, okay? Now, it, it is possible to have both infection and gout at the same time, okay? So it's a little bit tricky to treat. Uh, sometimes, if we're concerned, we'll treat both for infection and for gout until we get a final result back on the, on the culture from the fluid, okay, which takes a couple days to come back. Um, but if somebody has a history of gout, say they've had multiple uh, flares of gout in the past, and you know, they come in with a, their typical flare, whether it's a, a big toe that's uh, inflamed or it's a, a knee or, uh, or what have you, you know, a lot of times if there's no likely infection, we, we're pretty comfortable just treating for a gout flare uh, in those situations. Um, typically, if it's one joint that's involved, the best way to treat it is to put a little steroid injection right into the joint. Okay, if it's a lot of joints involved, uh, if, it's a lot, if it's a lot of joints involved, we, 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 we often treat more systemically with, with, with steroids or with colchicine or, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Motrin, uh, Aleve, those kinds of medications. Um, so these are what, this is what gout crystals look like under the, under the polarized microscope. Okay, so basically we look at the crystals, and I'm not going to go into the physics too much because I don't know the physics that well myself, but basically there's a, there's a polarizer on a microscope, okay, that basically bends light a certain direction when it hits a, a crystal of a certain shape, okay, and if, if you have the polarizer parallel to the uh, axis of the crystal, and the crystal is yellow, that's a gout crystal, okay, and it, it, it typically looks like a needle, like this, needle-shaped, if you have the, the polarizer perpendicular to the axis of the crystal, it shows up as a blue crystal, okay? And so basically, when you're using the microscope, you can tell which direction the polarizer is pointing, and you can then uh, determine whether this is, uh, you know, whether if this is yellow and it's in parallel with the polarizer, then it's a gout crystal, and if it's blue, and it's perpendicular. This is another example <coughs> of the yellow and blue uh, crystals. So we talked about acute gout. You know, somebody comes in, painful, red hot, swollen joint. Um, and so basically, as people, after they've had their first gout flare, they do tend to have future gout flares, okay? Um, and this is the rate at which people have recurrent gout flares, okay? 62% of people who remain untreated uh, after their first um, gout flare, will have another flare within the first year. Okay, 78% will have another flare within the first two years, and 93%, uh, if left untreated, will have another flare within 10 years. Okay, and as I mentioned, we will begin treatment with a medication to lower the uric acid level when uh, when we've um, a patients had more than uh, when a patient's had at least two flares in a given year, that's when we'll start uric acid oil therapy. Yes? Why not be much more aggressive than this? Why not uh, get that uric acid level down uh, even though they've only had one? Yeah, well, people don't like being on medications typically, and, it's, and some of these medications, these medications aren't without risk. Pretty much any medication we provide or prescribe could have some side effects, some risk. Okay, allopurinol, for example, which is the first medication we reach for to treat, to, to lower the uric acid level, it can have, uh, it can affect the bone marrow, can decrease the, the way that you produce blood cells, it can be a little bit toxic to the liver, you know, it can be toxic potentially to the kidneys. Uh, people can have actually a very severe allergic reaction to allopurinol. It's very rare, but when it happens, it's very severe. Okay, so we. We, ha we sort of weigh the risks and benefits, okay? Sometimes if people are having one, or one flare a year sort of thing, you know, typically they don't mind just treating it as it comes up with anti-inflammatories and, and then being off medication for the rest of the year until they have another flare. But it's when people start having two or more flares a year that it's really uncomfortable for them. You know, they're constantly, or not constantly, but they're more often in pain. They're dealing with this more frequently. And in cases like that, 
typically they want to be on something as well to prevent the gout flares. Um, and so as, as gout progresses untreated, okay, if you're having more and more gout flares and you're not on any medications to prevent them, what typically happens is you start to have flares more frequently, okay, less, a shorter period of time between flares. And uh, the flares, when they happen, are increasingly disabling. They typically involve more joints uh, at, a t at a time. And sometimes people start to have fevers associated with these flares. Uh, and then eventually, if left untreated, people will typically develop these tophi, okay? The, the level of uric acid in the body gets high enough that, that there's sort of a constant deposition of crystals around joints to form these, these masses of, of, of solid uric acid. Can I ask you a question? Yes. What, what is the side effect, like percentage of side effects with this allopurinol on, say, the liver, kidneys, bone marrow, et cetera, et cetera? Like, I mean, a large percentage of people taking these medications are, you know, like 20% are going to have side effects? Or no, no, I mean, the, the, main, the main side effect, if you put somebody in allopurinol, they might have a little stomach upset, a little nausea. Okay, probably 10 to 15 to 20 percent of people will experience some of that. Okay. You know, the, the things I'm talking about are pretty rare, oh, really? but, 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 they're, you know, but they happen frequently enough that we, we'd rather not put somebody on a medication if we, if we don't need to. Okay? Um, you know, and we, when we put somebody on allopurinol, we follow their blood, uh, their, their blood tests pretty, pretty regularly initially to make sure that there's not any <coughs> signs of problems with, with the bone marrow, with the liver, um, those sorts of things. Um, Euloric is considered a little bit better tolerated in general than allopurinol. Uh, it doesn't have quite the same, we don't have quite the same concern uh, with euloric in terms of affecting the, the liver, uh, you know, and it, a lot of times when people don't have good kidney function, we prefer euloric because it tends to be a little bit safer. Um, euloric's more expensive though. Allopurinol's been around longer, it's, it's much cheaper, and most insurance companies want us to start with allopurinol. Um, which is understandable. Uh, and then if a, if a person can't tolerate allopurinol or it's not getting their uric acid level low, low enough, then that's a, when we would switch to try Euloric. Yes? Um, in my research, I read a couple articles where it stated that the medications cause diabetics numbers to rise. Is that applicable to both of those drugs? That's applicable to steroids. <coughs> a lot of times we'll treat gout flares with steroids like prednisone. And that does cause your blood sugar to rise. These other medications don't tend to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what um, this is what gout looks like if it goes untreated. Okay, these are these are tophi uh, and this gentleman's fingers. And I I did part of my training at Harbor UCLA, and we actually get quite a few patients who aren't getting their gout treated, and they show up looking like this. Okay, and it's it's really a horrible. Horrible thing, as you can tell. Um, on on X-ray, if somebody has these large tophi, you can actually see that the the, the bones are, are eroding away. Okay, it's very damaging, very damaging to the bone to have these these tophi in, in the in the vicinity of the of the bone. And again, this is uh, in the foot, uh, same thing. It, you basically, you know, in these joints, you see a very clear outline of the bone. Okay, whereas this fifth. Uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint we call it is pretty much gone. You know, the, there's no, you can't even see the joint uh, lines at all because it's all been eaten away by this giant tophus. So then is that typical when you're diagnosing to take an x-ray? Um, I, I do tend to, like I, I, we do tend to check x-rays because the current recommendations are slightly different for how low you want to drive the uric acid level depending on whether someone has tophi or not. So if somebody has a tophi, on exam mm -hmm. or on an x-ray if they have erosions in the bone. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to get the uric acid level less than five because mm -hmm. that helps drive down the, the level even, even quicker and helps dissolve the tophi. Okay? Whereas if there's no tophi or no erosions in the bone, we shoot for a level less than six for the uric acid. Um, so the time course to develop these tophi, okay, if you're left untreated, is, can be anywhere from three years to 42 years uh, and, you know, average being about 12 years. Um, and the rate of formation depends on the uric acid level. If your uric acid level is extremely high, you're going to be more likely to form tophi uh, uh, quickly, whereas if your uric acid level is lower, it would be slower formation. 
Okay, so we've talk, talked a little bit about treat mode. I'll, 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 I'll tell you again here. So basically, like I mentioned, we, there's, there's two aspects to treating gout, and this is something that, that it, there's a lot of confusion about, okay? There's treating gout flares, and then there's preventing gout flares and chronic gout, okay? The way to treat gout flares is with anti-inflammatories, okay? Non-steroidal <coughs> anti-inflammatories, colchicine, prednisone. The way to prevent gout flares is to keep the uric acid level down, okay? And that's with medications like allopurinol, euloric, uh, probenicid, uh, those, those types of medications. And some of the, you know, I mentioned this, the non steroidals, ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, also known as Aleve, indomethacin. These are all examples of non steroidals that we can use to treat gout flares. Uh, colchicine, this is typically the rheumatologist favorite. Okay, if you come in with a gout flare that just started within the past day, this is typically the medication we use because we find that it's probably the most effective. Um, in cases where people have had a flare for more than 48 hours or so, sometimes colchicine doesn't quite work as well, and in those cases, sometimes we'll, we'll start some prednisone or steroid because that tends to be a little bit more effective. Um, and again, the steroids, if, if, uh, if there's a lot of joints involved or if there's, um, even if like you have the big toe involved, um, you know, a lot of times if it's a fairly difficult joint to inject, we'll, we'll be treating you with oral medications anyway. Uh, but the best treatment, if you're pretty confident it's gout, uh, the best treatment for a single joint is to just put some steroid right in the joint and that causes, it helps to calm down the inflammation right there in the joint, has less of the side effects of taking an oral steroid which can cause more systemic side effects uh, including increased risk for infection, thinning of the bones, adrenal uh, suppression, these sorts of things. Yes? If you can't take the insets, um, is there a topical or something you could put on there that would help? Um, you know, the kidney damage, you can't take those. Yeah, so if you have kidney problems, we wouldn't treat you with a non steroidal. I mean, you, you could put a topical non steroidal, like Voltaren gel, for example, uh, on a joint, but probably not going to work that well for an acute gout attack. It might help a little bit, but probably not well enough. Um, also, Voltaren gel, even though you're putting it on topically, some of it does get absorbed into the body. So it can have some of the same side effects and effects on the kidney as oral uh, uh, non steroidals Not typically as much as an oral, but, but it can. So we, t we tend to avoid those if, if with kidney failure. Yes? How about, like, like, since most of the cases are with the toe, kind of a dumb question, but why can't you just drain the toe? Or well, open the toe and, I mean, it sounds a little rough, but, you know, I mean, it's blown up. It's gonna take a couple of days, as we all know, probably. And it's painful. Why not just? <laughs> you're not going to hammer and hit it. But you and you, cer you certainly can. You certainly can. And I and I have. We do do that sometimes, but it, it hurts. Basically, um, patients don't tend to want a needle stuck into their their big toe. A, a knee is a knee is different because there tends to be more fluid, and it's 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 easier to get into a knee. But a, but a, a a big toe, for example, if that's red hot and painful, so exquisitely painful that most patients are like I you know, I don't want a needle. In there, I mean, we can definitely do it, and people do benefit from from doing that. But it's just a matter of patient comfort and, and whether they want to pursue that or not. Um, yes. I have a gout on both feet at the same time, and I had the injection in each one. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had um, the auto putting all that the um, the medicine, Alpurinol. the allo putting all. Uh huh. And uh, interfere with my kidneys. The alpurinol did. Very very sick. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. Very very sick. Yeah. No. And that and that and again, again, that's why we try to avoid these medications if we can, is because they can cause side and effects. Then what I have, what I do is I have a half a pill of uh, cold cream mm -hmm. that is every night. Uh huh. It's it's very little, but. Um, I have half, half a deal. Do, is that, have you recently started a different medication for, to get your uric acid level down, like uh, Euloric uh, or Probenicid, something like that? Well, the doctor says for preventing another... Right. So, they, so, so your doctor's made the decision not to lower the uric acid level at this point because you had the problem with the allopurinol? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that is something that can be done as well. I mean, if, if there's... 
reasons to not put someone on a medication to drop the uric acid level down, you know, chronic anti-inflammatory therapy can work as well, such as colchicine to prevent, yeah. prevent the flares. Yeah. Have you heard of a product called Gout Complete? Gout Complete? Yeah. Uh, I've heard of it. I don't know that I know exactly what's in it, but. It's a liquid. I just tried it, and uh, not to sell it, but you know how your foot gets and you can't even move your toe and the pain's incredible? You take about a half an ounce of that, and within five minutes you can move your toe. I'm not kidding. Wow. It's not sold here in California. It's sold out of Utah. Is it, a, is it an anti-inflammatory of some kind? Or? I have no idea what it is. It costs 24 bucks. You can Google it and go gout complete. Uh -huh. And the guy sells it out of Utah. There's nowhere in California that has it. It's shipped to your house. It's a little ball with a little cap, and you can take it. Honestly, I've got about four of my friends on it. They think it's a miracle drug because okay. it happens. It goes away within five minutes. I'm not kidding. I, I, your toe is that big. You uh -huh. can't even walk. You like, don't even want to look at it. You take a half an ounce of that. Uh -huh. A full shot of it, an ounce of it, the relief is it gets better and better real quickly. Fast. Oh, good. I mean, I'm, guess, I'm guessing there's probably some anti-inflammatory something in it, but um, but that's great. I mean, whatever slow, you know, you whatever works. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. Biofreeze, which is better. Biofreeze. The name again? Gout complete. You can pull it up on any Google search, and it'll pop it up for you. Is biofreeze something you found that works well too? Yeah. Or? Oh, good. Like a gel. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's like an anti topical yeah. anti inflammatory. Okay. You don't need a prescription for it. You can order it on I see. Okay. Okay. Great. What is the normal range of uric acid in a person that is normal and has never had gout? Sure. No, the uric acid level tends to range between three and a half and seven. Three and a half, seven and a half, that kind of range. And again, people can have a uric acid level greater than six and not have gout. But, <coughs> but by keeping uric acid level less than six, we prevent gout. <coughs> Sorry, I've had some reactive airway disease recently. <coughs> 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 so some of the side effects, um, non steroidal anti-inflammatories are great medications for inflammation. A lot of side effects, especially in the kidneys, um, people with any kind of kidney problem, we like to avoid these medications because they can make kidney problems worse. Um, you know, very rarely non steroidals can cause some liver uh, toxicity, uh, it can cause high blood pressure. They have found I don't know how many of you are familiar with Vioxx, but it was a medic, an anti-inflammatory that came on the market in 2004 and then quickly got taken off the market when they realized people were having heart attacks on this medication. Okay? And when that happened, they went back and they studied basically all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as a, as, a, as a group. And they found that basically all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as Aleve, Ibuprofen, uh, these kind of medications, do increase your risk of heart attacks. Okay, Aleve, okay, naproxen is the one anti-inflammatory non-steroidal that doesn't have a clear association with an increased risk of a, of a cardiac event. So that's the, we consider that one the safest one for anybody who's had a history of any kind of heart issue. But in general, as a group, they increase the risk of a cardiac event two to threefold. Okay, so, we, so we're a little bit careful with them in people with high blood pressure or other um, potential risks of heart condition. <coughs> um, colchicine, uh, again, this medication can cause some what we call bone marrow suppression, or your bone marrow, which is where your blood cells come from. Uh, colchicine can sometimes block that process and stop the, the blood cells from being produced. It uh, can also cause some toxicity to the liver. Occasionally can cause uh, problems with your nerves and with muscle. Okay. So we, we, when we put people on colchicine, we tell them to let us know if they start to feel weak or if they start to have strange sensations uh, in their limbs. It can also cause diarrhea, and that's why it previously was used uh, as a purgative in, in ancient uh, Greece. Um, and if you start to have diarrhea on colchicine, it's often a sign of toxicity. And so we often recommend that if people start having diarrhea, that they should cut back on the dose. Um, steroids, again, 
are very potent anti-inflammatories with a lot of side effects, okay, especially if they're taken over an extended period of time. Um, they increase the risk of infection because they suppress the immune system. Uh, they do, can cause high blood pressure, irritation in the stomach. They can worsen your diabetes, uh, can thin your bones, can cause your adrenal glands, which produce the natural steroids that, that allow us to, to carry out our, our metabolic functions. It can cause our, our adrenal glands to be less able to do that. And so if you've been on steroids for an extended time, uh, your doctor will often lower the dose gradually so that your adrenal glands can catch up and make their own um, steroids again. Um, so we've sort of talked about this, but basically if somebody has an acute gout flare, um, we, we sort of, based on, on what other problems they might have, we decide what the best medication is going to be, okay? Um, so basically if, if, the, if the kidney and liver function is normal, and we often reach for colchicine, um, if there's any problems with the kidneys or the liver, we often reach for steroids, okay, because those don't tend to have adverse events to people with kidney and, and liver problems. Uh, you know, if there's a single joint involved, we'll often, you know, try to put some steroid right into the, into the joint. Um, and then again, if there's normal kidney and liver function and there's low risk for any heart problems or any uh, uh, gastrointestinal upset, you know, well, we can use non-steroidals, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like uh, ibuprofen, Aleve, those sorts of things. Hello, Purinol is not on the chart. Uh, that's because this is a treatment for acute gout. So again, again, there's treatment for acute gout, which is, which is with anti-inflammatories, and then there's treatment to prevent gout, which is with allopurinol, euloric, uh, probenicid, those, those kinds of medications. And so, so to treat uh, the high uric acid level, and therefore to help prevent gout uh, flares, we use, you know, allopurinol, for buxostat, that's, that's the same thing as euloric. Um, we, we can sometimes, and, and those block the formation of uric acid, uh, we also can increase the excretion of uric acid to the kidneys uh, using uh, probenicid, okay? Um, and then I think I mentioned the peglodicase, which is the very powerful enzyme that breaks down uric acid. Um, uh, and that, that can be used in cases when, when these other uh, medications are either contraindicated because of some uh, other problem a patient has or if these agents aren't effective for some reason. Some of the side effects of allopurinol, I kind of went over, but, it, you know, rash, diarrhea, nausea, <coughs> liver toxicity, bone marrow suppression, severe allergic reaction, uh, can, can rarely affect the kidneys as well. Uh, the euloric can cause, you know, nausea, rash, some liver toxicity, but in general, this one's considered uh, a little bit safer than allopurinol in somebody who's got a lot of what we call comorbidities or, or you know, potential other problems, including problems with the liver, kidneys, uh, those well, sorts of things. how long should you take these things? So that's a very good question. So basically, gout should be viewed as a chronic condition, okay, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol. It's a condition that's going to be, it's something that needs to be managed basically for a lifetime, okay? So somebody who comes, and they, they've been having more and more gout flares, and we make the decision to start them on a medication to keep the uric acid level down, essentially will need to be on that medication for life. Okay, so if we start you on allopurinol, um, you can think of it as starting somebody on a blood pressure medication. Okay, if they, you know, if somebody comes with a blood pressure that's too high, we'll start them on a blood pressure medication to keep it under control. And typically, when people are started on blood pressure medications, they tend to be on them for, for their life. And the same goes for gout, because if we take you off the medication, you're, you're just, the uric acid level is gonna rise up again and you're gonna have gout flares. So it's, it's, it's usually, it's considered a chronic condition that we treat with chronic medications. Um, so probenicid, because it helps to excrete uric acid through the urine and the kidneys, it can increase the formation of kidney stones. Okay, uric acid crystals can form, uh, or uric acid stones can form in the kidneys. Um, uh, you can also, you know, have, have an allergic reaction. It can rarely cause hemolytic anemia, which is where your red blood cells get broken down. Um, and that's people who miss or are lacking an uh, an enzyme called G6PD. Um, so we always check before we put somebody on probenicid, we check this enzyme to make sure you have this uh, and that you're able to, to, to metabolize this medication. Uh, can rarely cause liver toxicity, nausea, and rash. I mentioned the peglota case. Uh, this is always the last one we reach for to lower the uric acid level because it's, um, number one, it's very expensive and it's, uh, um, uh, there are some issues with this one because over time if you use this, we find that 
it becomes less and less effective over time. So it, we, we, you know, uh, this tends to be less, um, it's one of the ones we reach for last. Uh, and it can cause rash, bruising, nausea, uh, antibody, for, antibody formation. Which this is what causes this to become less effective over time, is there's an antibody that forms to the molecule and therefore makes it less <coughs> effective. <coughs> So this is just a brief um, schematic. So we've got the purines, which get broken down into xanthine, which get broken down into the uric acid. Okay, so the allopurinol and the uloric, uh, they, they block this uh, pathway, so the, the conversion of xanthine to urate. Um, if we use something like peglodicase, it essentially uh, uh, converts the urate to allantoin, which can be excreted um, from the body. Um, if there's uric acid crystals formed and cause a gout flare, then again we use these anti-inflammatories to treat uh, the gout flare. Um, and basically, this is just showing that uric acid uh, uh, elimination is, is decreased by uh, these various things, including metabolic syndrome, including uh, high insulin levels that happen to people with diabetes. Um, uh, using diuretics, uh, aspirin can affect how much uric acid is lost through the kidneys as well. Uh, the, renal, uh, the kidney elimination of uric acid is increased by some of these uh, medications. I mentioned that women who are premenopausal tend to have fewer gout flares, probably because some of the, the sex hormones like estrogen, uh, which increase the, the excretion of uric acid through the kidneys. So these are some frequent misunderstandings regarding gout management. This is, this is something that I hear often in, in clinic. If, I, if I'm treating somebody for gout, they might come in and say, you know, I started the, because we, we typically, when we're treating someone for gout, we, we give them a medication to prevent gout flares while we're getting the uric acid level down. Because as I mentioned, when we start medications like allopurinol that drop the uric acid level, puts you at risk for a gout flare. Okay, so whenever we start a medication to get that uric acid level down, we'll put you on an anti-inflammatory in the background, like colchicine. Okay. And effectively, we need to have you on a, the anti-inflammatory for several months. Okay? Even once we get your uric acid level to the goal level, the recommendation is to keep you on the anti-inflammatory for several months after that okay? to help prevent gout flares because it takes a while for everything to settle out uh, in terms of the uric acid. Um, and so and there's always a lot of uh, confusion and misunderstanding when, when, we, when we prescribe these medications for gout because people think that the allopurinol is going to help treat a gout flare. So they might, if they have a gout flare, they might take the allopurinol instead of the colchicine, or they might, you know, uh, start on the allopurinol and then stop the colchicine, uh, uh, or they, they feel like they're doing well. They've started an allopurinol, they haven't had a gout flare, so they'll stop the allopurinol and then they'll have a gout flare. Um, and then there's a lot of misunderstanding about whether or not to continue the colchicine with the allopurinol. Uh, would, would you please be much more specific? about those four items and what was wrong? What was the misunderstanding? Sure, sure, and, and this is... I started the here and also I stopped the culture team. What's wrong with that? Yeah. Sure, I see that, and, and this, this is exactly what, what, I, what I mean. This is where the misunderstanding lies, is, is um, the treatment of gout, okay, requires two things. It requires treating an active gout flare if it comes on, and it requires getting the uric acid level down so that you don't have gout flares, okay, to prevent gout flares. And when we start a medication to get the uric acid level down to prevent gout flares, anytime we, have, we, we manipulate that uric acid level, so anytime we're driving that down with a medication, that paradoxically puts you at increased risk for a gout flare. Okay, so to prevent that gout flare while we're dropping that uric acid level, we'll put you on a medication like colchicine uh, or, or an anti-inflammatory like uh, ibuprofen or something to prevent the gout flare while we're decreasing your uric acid level, okay? Well, number one, he maybe stopped the culture because he had diarrhea. Yeah. So, but I, okay, what I meant, what I meant to imply here is that is that the, the person felt like, okay, I'm on the alpurinol now, so I don't need the colchicine anymore. Um, like a store, specifically, you take the uh, uh, alpurinol all the time, but you take the other one. Only if you have a flare. Yeah, so my guess is, my guess is that, is that you're at the stage where your uric acid level, are you, are you on a stable dose of allopurinol now or something? Okay, 
So what happens is if you're at the stage where your uric acid level is, is at goal, okay, less than six or less than five or wherever your doctor wants you, if you're at that level for, for several months, at that point we'll stop the colchicine, okay, and we'll only use it if you have a gout flare, okay? But you'll remain on that dose of alpurinol yeah. essentially for the rest of your life to keep that uric acid level down and help prevent flares. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, so that, that's, that's later on. What's that? And it works. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's later on. This, this, these items that I put up here just for discussion's sake are, are typically uh, when people are first getting started on medications to get their uric acid level down. There's a lot of confusion as to when they should be taking the allopurinol and the colchicine. And the bottom line, they should be taking both, okay? Um, and consistently, too, because, you know, even missing a dose of allopurinol here or there can cause that uric acid level to fluctuate a little bit and cause a, cause a gout flare. Uh, let me continue to number two. Uh, so I restarted my allopurinol. Is the point here, it should never have been stopped? Um, no, I just, well, I guess what I... I, sorry, I didn't mean to be, I was just putting these in here as things that I've heard from people and I wasn't really quite thinking about the context that, and I'm sorry that, it, that it's a little bit misleading, but basically what I meant to point out here is that you shouldn't start and stop allopurinol when you're having a gout flare because it, it can make it worse, okay? So anytime you feel a gout flare coming on, if, you are, if you're on allopurinol or euloric or whatever your uric, uric acid lowering medication is, you should stay on it, okay? If you stop it, you can make your gout flare worse. If you start it, like let's say, you've, you, you, let's say you haven't been on it, and then you have a gout flare, and then you start the allopurinol while you're having the gout flare, you can actually make the gout flare worse. So the, the bottom line is if you're on uric acid lowering therapy, you should just stay on it if you start to have a flare. Okay, you shouldn't stop it. You also shouldn't start it if you haven't been on it when you're having a gout flare. That takes care of number three. And number four, uh, uh, you, you only stop colchicine because you have diarrhea or something. Well, I mean, you stop the colchicine after a few months if your uric acid level is low enough. But certainly if you're having diarrhea, you'll, you'll, you'll call your doctor and you'll cut back on it because that's a sign that it's, it's a little bit toxic to you. Um, uh, but the point I was trying to make there is just that there's some confusion out there about when we start these medications, people, people think, okay, well, I've... You know, I've been on the allopurinol for about a week or so, and, the, you know, on the colchicine, I don't know why I'm on the colchicine too. I'll just stop the colchicine. The problem is, again, then, then what happens if the allopurinol is on without the colchicine, you're, you're, you're affecting the uric acid level, you're dropping the uric acid level, which is going to put you at risk for a flare. In fact, you'll probably have a flare of gout if you don't have the background anti-inflammatory to prevent that. Yes? How long does it take, like, say, the average person, if you're on the allopurinol or whatever, um, and the, the colchicine to get that around the five or six, you know, uric acid level. Yeah. And how so, much a dosage? Yeah, so it depends, it depends where you're starting from. Okay. okay, it depends a little bit on your kidney function. Okay. Uh, we're, 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 we're much more ginger if your kidneys aren't working well. We start slowly. Um, and we typically start slowly anyway because <coughs> different people have different sensitivity and, and, uh, to these medications. So usually we'll start at a low dose of allopurinol between 100 and 300 milligrams a day. And then we'll, we'll have you repeat some blood work in two or three weeks to see how, how low the uric acid level has gotten. If it's not at goal yet, we'll bump up the, the allopurinol uh, to a higher level. And then again, repeat your blood work in two or three weeks and see if we've gotten you to goal. So it's just sort of a gradual process. We try to use the lowest dose we can that gets your uric acid level to the, to the, to the gold dose. Um, yes? Should people, since the kidneys are so involved in this disease, should people who suffer from gout use a rheumatologist as well as a nephrologist? Well, I mean, it depends on the situation. You know, typically gout can actually be managed by, by the primary care doctor, okay? Um, although I have found that a lot of times there's some confusion even amongst the primary care doctors about the appropriate way to institute these medications. Um, you know, if there is, if a person does have kidney problems, we usually don't enlist, uh, if, if the person has known kidney problems and we understand why they're having kidney problems, we don't usually enlist the help of a kidney doctor, okay? If we have somebody on these medications and they start to have worsening kidney function, 
then number one, if one, if, if one of the medications could be causing the kidney function to worsen, we'll usually stop it. And number two, we'll have you see a kidney doctor at that point to sort of help us out and, and, and help us figure out what's going on. Yes? I understand the, uh, the, the two <coughs> differences between the two drugs. But my question is, is what determines which one the doctor will put you on? <coughs> between alipurinol, euloric, mm -hmm. probenicid, uh, those ones? Yeah, and it's brand new at it. So there's no, you haven't taken it to find out whether you, you can tolerate it or not. So typically, um, <clears throat> typically we'll start with allopurinol because it's, it's cheap. We've used it for a long time. We're aware of its side effects. Most people tolerate it very well. It works very well. Um, sorry. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, so typically we'll start with allopurinol. Even people, even people with kidney problems, it's, it's okay to start allopurinol. We just started at a very low level. Okay. I'm just going to say that if, if, you, if you remove the cost factor, that, uh, which one would be the one that would be considered the better of the two? If you remove the cost factor, um, I think most people would probably reach for euloric first. It's a little bit, I think people, it, it's, it tends to have a little bit less side effects a little bit easier on the uh, liver you know it's better if somebody does have a little bit of kidney failure or the kidneys aren't working quite right it tends to be safer so I think if all else being equal probably most people would reach for Eulor. Is there a genetic component to gout? Um, so there can be yeah there's certain 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 families seem to have more gout than others and whether that's a genetic uh, process by, by, by just the way they eliminate uric acid through the urine, maybe they're, they're, they're lacking, you know, uh, there's something different about the way they reabsorb uric acid, for example, and they, they have, you know, they're more likely to accumulate uric acid. Um, there are genetic propensities, um, but typically gout is, is more of an environmental condition based on, um, on, on, on your food intake, your, your level of, uh, you know, level of, if, you, if you're obese, if you have other, you know, risk factors for gout. Yes? Is there only one level of the colchicine? Uh, in terms of dosing? Yes. No, the um, <clears throat> colchicine is dosed based on kidney function. Mm. Okay, so if you have problems with your kidneys, we, we, we lower the dose to help prevent the medication from becoming toxic. Colchicine doesn't harm the kidneys, but because it's, it's excreted and metabolized by the kidneys, if your kidneys aren't working very well, we, we, we make sure we put you on a lower dose mm. to help prevent toxic problems from the colchicine. <laughs> Um, so we dose by that. I think, uh, as I told you, uh, half a pill, uh -huh. um, and it's uh, 0 0.6, and it's half a pill. So you take 0 0.3? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's fine. I'm assuming your, your um, doctor has made that assessment based on either how you've uh, felt on the medication in the past or whether, there's any, whether your kidneys aren't filtering very well. As your doctor mentioned, why he likes or yeah, she likes well, that dose? I take the half because I can take more. <clears throat> it makes me run to the bathroom. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, your doctor has probably realized, well, you're pretty sensitive to it. It's, yeah. It can become toxic in you pretty easily. So, they probably decided to sort of hold you at that mm -hmm. lower level. Yeah. As long as it works for yeah. the gout, that's the, that's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so as I mentioned, gout is a chronic condition. We treat it chronically, just like high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And so I've sort of, I've t again, this is, because this is a recurring point of, of misunderstanding, I, I sort of want to just focus on this one, one last time. So one of the keys to managing this condition is that you need a background anti-inflammatory, okay, like I mentioned, colchicine, nonsteroidals, prednisone, if, if somebody doesn't have good kidney function, um, to prevent the gout flare while we're lower, lowering the uric acid, okay? And this can be done either for at least six months, so let's say we get your uric acid down after a month to the level we want, okay? We'll either continue the background colchicine uh, for six months or We'll do it for either three months after the uric acid level is less than six in somebody who doesn't have TOFI, or for at least six months after the uric acid is less than six in somebody with, and actually less than five, because the goal is actually less than five in somebody with TOFI. Uh, we'll continue it for six months. Okay, so we'll continue that background anti-inflammatory 
for several months after we get your uric acid level to the gold level, okay? Because even though the uric acid level is, is stable, you're still at an increased risk of flare for several months after we get the uric acid level down. Excuse me, yes. what, would, <coughs> what would be a background dose on prednisone? On prednisone? Prednisone we don't like to use if we don't have to, um, but if, if somebody's kidney function isn't very good and we're afraid to use colchicine, uh, for example, or non steroidal anti inflammatories, uh, we tend to use, uh, you know, at most about 10 milligrams of prednisone. We try to keep it less than 10 milligrams. Yeah, we're kind of at that level, but we're also treating sarcoid at the same time. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so, um, and then basically the, the uric acid lowering therapy, the, the allopurinol, the, the euloric, um, again, should be continued on a lifelong basis to keep that uric acid level down. Okay, if you keep that uric acid level less than six, you essentially can prevent gout flares. What about okay. taking the prednisone and the euloric together? That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Or the alpyrinol and Aleve instead of the colchicine? Yeah, you could do Aleve instead of, instead of the colchicine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you have something, less, as long as you have something there to prevent uh, a gout flare from taking hold. And that can be a, a, a non-steroidal like Aleve or ibuprofen. Could be colchicine. Like yeah, like you need to be on that consistently. Consistent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At least for the first several months after they get the uric acid level down. Okay. After that, after the uric acid level has been down for, for three to six months at, at the gold level, that's when we feel it's safe to take you off of the background anti-inflammatory and just have you on the, 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 the allopurinol or the, the euloric or whatever, whatever medication has been chosen. And then you, then you just use the anti-inflammatory as needed for flares. But if your uric acid level is low enough, you shouldn't be having flares anyway. Okay. A question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, these days doctors hate to give you blood tests if they can avoid it. Maybe there's some cost involved or something. But with, uh, uh, not, with sugar, there are neat uh, devices using infrared, comparative infrared, to tell you what your sugar level is with a very simple finger test. Uh -huh. Do we have one for uric acid? No. <laughs> it's a good idea, though. Yeah. But why not? Well, I think probably because, I think probably because the if you have diabetes, for example, your blood sugars can go up and down, up and down, depending on, you know, a lot of different things, what you eat mainly. Um, and that's going to be a chronic problem. Whereas with uric acid levels, we're only really going to be curious about your uric acid level for the first few weeks while we get it down to the level that and we it want. it does not fluctuate so quickly? Yeah, once, it really, it really is quite stable. Once, once you're on a stable dose of, of a medication like allopurinol, and your uric acid level has dropped down to the dose to, to the level it's going to be at at that dose of medication it tends to be very very stable in that level it doesn't tend to fluctuate very much well a Taiwanese uh, <coughs> company wants to sell me some of these devices oh. for measuring your acid level and uh, it's, it's probably fraudulent or something well it might not be i mean there's nothing i mean if i don't think there's anything wrong with having a device that checks your uric acid level. i just i don't think it would be quite as attractive for the market as, as something to check your blood sugar, I guess is what I'm, what I'm saying. I mean, it, it, I'm sure a lot of people would, would be interested in that, but I, I don't, as I say, as long as you're taking your medications as prescribed, typically you don't really, it's not going to change much. Uric acid level is not going to change much. What's the highest uric acid level you've ever seen in any of your patients? Uh, <laughs> 13, 14. Wow. Yeah. And patients with uric acid level that high, sometimes we'll treat them even if they haven't had a gout flare, sometimes we'll treat them just because there's some thought that having a uric acid level that high can actually put you at risk for kidney problems itself, okay? Um, the uric acid itself can possibly be toxic to the kidneys at that level, so sometimes we'll even treat. Um, but some people can walk around with a uric acid level that high and not have gout flares. I mean, they're sure at risk for, for having it, but, they, but, they, but it hasn't, for whatever reason, sometimes it hasn't set in yet, so. Um, so I'll briefly talk about associated conditions. And there's a lot of work going on right now to determine if, if uric acid causes these conditions or those conditions cause a uric acid level or they just happen to occur together. Okay, right now, most of what we think is that these things just happen to occur together, okay? Because the risk factors for a high uric acid level are the same as the risk factors for somebody, uh, you know, to have diabetes or, or high blood pressure. 
Okay, so, but some of the conditions have been found to be associated with a high uric acid level are, are, are these. Obesity, um, kidney disease, high triglycerides, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, which is basically early diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, and hypothyroidism. Um, metabolic syndrome, again, is, is considered sort of an early process of developing diabetes. Okay, it's characterized by abdominal obesity, uh, also known as, as truncal obesity, uh, impaired fasting glucose, insulin resistance, uh, elevated insulin levels, uh, high triglycerides, um, low HDL, which is the good uh, cholesterol, uh, and high blood pressure. Um, and the, the link uh, that they find between high, uh, between gout and um, metabolic syndrome is that the hyperuricemia or elevated uric acid level tends to correlate with a degree of insulin resistance, okay? And people who are insulin resistant, meaning they have metabolic syndrome, they're not able to process sugars as well. Uh, um, those people also tend to have high uric acid levels. And whether that's because those are people who are maybe eating too much and taking in too many of the foods that can lead to, to gout and high uric acid uh, uh, is, not, is not clear. But, but there is an association between high uric acid and um, metabolic syndrome. Uh, coronary artery disease. So some studies have shown that um, patients who experience gout attacks have an increased risk of, of heart attacks. And again, um, you know, in this particular study, they, they, they didn't find that it could be explained by that patient's uh, kidney function, metabolic syndrome, diuretic use, or traditional cardiovascular risk factors, meaning that there's something about having gout flares specifically that puts them at risk for heart attack, at least in this study. Okay, I think that the verdict's still out as to whether, you know, whether this is just from having a high uric acid level because you have other risk factors that have you, cause you to have a high uric acid level, such as diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, um, things of that nature, which increase your risk of heart disease as well. Um, so they, they find that, you know, a significant percentage of gout patients lose a little bit of albumin in, through their kidneys, which is a sign of a little bit of uh, mild damage uh, to the kidneys. Uh, this tends to wax and wane. You know, people with gout don't tend to have, don't tend to lose mass amounts of protein in their urine or anything like that, but there is little signals that there may be some irritation in the kidney um, caused by uh, having uh, uh, high uric acid. Um, it seems, however, that to cause damage to the kidneys, you know, any real um, problems with the kidneys, you really need to have a very elevated uric acid level, okay, more than 13 in men and more than 10 in women. And there is some evidence to suggest that the uric, uric acid, uh, um, uh, does cause a little bit of damage uh, to the kidneys. Okay, sometimes kidney damage can lead to high blood pressure because the kidneys actually help to regulate your blood pressure by managing how much fluid you have in your blood vessels. Um, so there seems to be some association between uh, uric acid at a high level and uh, kidney um, function. And so there's something called urate ne nephropathy, which is a little bit different. So there's hyperuricemia causing kidney problems when the uric acid level is high enough, you know, just having the uric acid level be that high can cause some problems with the kidney. There's also something called urate nephropathy, which is when urate crystals actually deposit in the kidneys, okay, and it can cause a little bit of inflammatory reaction in the kidney, but this hasn't been shown or found to, to, to cause any significant uh, problems in terms of um, uh, uh, contributing to, to kidney disease. Okay, it's mostly they think that there's some coexisting um, conditions that, that are probably the main uh, things causing uh, the problems with the kidneys. Kidney stones are very frequent uh, in people with uh, gout. Sometimes people can actually come to our attention uh, as having a high uric acid level. You know, they might show up with a kidney stone before they have uh, a gout attack. Is um, that only for one particular kind of uh, uh, kidney stone? No, I mean, you'd think it would mostly be uric acid stones, but it, calcium stones as well. Calcium oxalate stones are also higher in people with, with, with gout for unclear reasons, but they do find that there's not just uric acid stones, but also uh, calcium stones. Um, and the, the likelihood of having a kidney stone increases again with the uric acid level. Okay, the higher the, uh, the uric acid level, the more likely you'll have a kidney stone. And also, if you're losing a lot of uric acid through the kidneys, that can be a nidus or, or trigger to, to form a stone. 
Um, so for example, when we give somebody probenicid, which is one of the medications that lowers the uric acid level by causing people to excrete uric acid through the urine, that does put them at risk for a kidney stone. Okay? And people who have had kidney stones, we try to avoid probenicid in those cases because we don't want to give them another kidney stone. Um, so the, uh, treat, treating the high uric acid level can help prevent um, some of the kidney stones. Okay, so brief summary. So gout is a debilitating inflammatory arthritis caused by deposition of uric acid crystals in joints and soft tissues. Um, uric acid is derived from the breakdown of purines, which are ingested in the diet and also produced by the body. Um, untreated gout progresses from an asymptomatic period of high uric acid um, to intermittent flares of gout to the chronic tophaceous gout. I showed you the pictures of the, 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 the large deposits of gout um, under the skin. Um, Gout, again, is, is associated with several conditions um, that can have an adverse impact on somebody's lifespan, okay, including metabolic syndrome, diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease, heart disease. And again, we're still working out, you know, whether the, the uric acid being high causes these things or those things cause the uric acid level to be high or if they're just occurring in the same population because they sort of happen for the same reasons, we don't, we don't know for sure. Um, Gout's a chronic condition requiring chronic treatment to prevent flares and ultimate damage to joints through formation of TOFI. Um, and then this is the main key, I think, that, that the main misunderstanding is that the treatment comes in two forms, okay, anti-inflammatory management of acute flare and prevention of flares and chronic gout by controlling the uric acid level. Okay, if there's one thing I want to impart is, is, is that, is that we have, we, there's always two components to the treatment of gout. There's treating flares when they arise, there's lowering the uric acid level, okay? And when we're lowering the uric acid level initially, we need to have an anti-inflammatory on board as well to prevent a gout flare, okay? And then once the uric acid level is down for several months, we can stop the anti-inflammatory and just keep you on the, the medication to keep the uric acid level down, yeah. You know, the exercise that, you know, getting diabetes under control, getting, you know, high blood pressure under control, I mean, probably, it's probably not going to hurt. You know, I think, you know, it may help. I mean, I think the bottom line is, though, once you're at a level where you have gout, your uric acid level has risen to a point where you're, you're having more frequent flares, it's going to be hard to, to reverse that just with, you know, lifestyle changes alone. I mean, you, you, may, you may help. It may help. But it, I think it's going to be hard to get your, your uric acid level down to a level that you're going to stop having gout flares without the addition of a medication of some kind. So... Um, other, other questions? Yeah. Uh -huh. Three, three, if I can get them all. Mm -hmm. um, is there a site that lists food purines? Like a website that lists yeah. food purines? We haven't been able to find one. Is there one that the doctors might know about? Um, I mean, I think there's not one that we refer to. I mean, we tend to use, we have certain resources for uh, you know, giving people information about gout. Um, one of the ones we use is called Up to Date, uh, which has like the latest. I mean, a couple of the, my slides were actually from Up to Date, but those were also the slides that didn't mention some of the things that you had, had considered. So, um, but you know, I don't think there's there's certainly no one resource that that has all the information about the gout. Same way that there is, there was, is there a site that gives you a diet? We've looked at several, and one says, yes, you can eat this one, and we go to the next one says, no, you shouldn't have this one, but which one do you believe? I mean, I, if you can, I would, I would try to use websites that appear to be based on studies that have been done, okay? Uh, for example, WebMD, I'm guessing, probably has some pretty I solid data. I would try to avoid, you know, websites that look like they're maybe, you know, not based on a... I've been trying to this also. WebMD, Wikipedia, all that. Yeah. Highly high theory reviewed, mm -hmm. excellent sources. Yeah. They are sloppy on that. Okay. Now, wh why don't you, does uh, UCLA have some kind of a, a web source for help? Uh, you know, I think, I mean, I think the rheumatology website maybe talks a little bit about these conditions, but it certainly wouldn't go into the detail that, 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 that I think you're looking for. I mean, maybe even the Arthritis Foundation is here tonight. Do you have pamphlets on gout that have some of this information about like diets and things? 
Um, if they go onto our website, they can find some information on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, 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 the keyword there is slum. I mean, I think the reason I think the reason you're not finding a really good gold standard is that we just we don't know for sure. We haven't really delineated delineated these things very well. Okay. We 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 have a sense of okay, these particular food groups tend to cause gout and elevated purines and high uric acid, um, and I. I think you're looking for a level of detail that maybe hasn't been teased out yet. Well, the um, last question I have is, do you know of any support groups? You can't find a support group in the LA area. Really? Um, there was a team gout support group. That's all we could find. OK. You know, I, to be honest, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it seems like it'd be a natural, a natural thing. thing. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's something that, that should be started. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of any gout support. I mean, there must be some out there, I would think. But I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's a really good idea. Yeah, it's a very good idea. Yeah. It's a good idea, but who's good at Yeah. Okay. After pulling all this information, it's kind of important. Colchicine? Uh, depends what you're taking the prednisone for. If you're taking the prednisone to, for, for the, for what? For sarcoidosis. Um, it depends on the dose, 10. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure what, how, how that was arrived at or what, uh, you know, what your physician is, is, is thinking about in terms of the gout management. I mean, if, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with seeing what happened if you come off of colchicine. The colchicine? Okay. Um, now, is a 10 milligram dose of sarco, is that pretty constant or is that constant. going up and down? Constant. Okay. It's constant at the moment. We should have a sarc attack for a while. So. Okay. So, I mean, if it's something that could be, it's going to be going up or down, or especially down, like if the steroid dose is going to be going down at some point, which typically we shoot for that, we try to shoot for that, um, it could be that your doctor's keeping you on some colchicine just to keep that as a stable thing. And then when the prednisone dose is fluctuating, you'll still have the colchicine there to prevent. That, that's what I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you.